Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Orsola Costantini. I'm an Economic Affairs Officer at UNCTEP's Globalization Development Strategies Division. And I want to welcome you to this fourth day of the UNCTED YSI uh, Summer School. Um, if you followed uh, the previous days of summer school, you know we've uh, talked about uh, finance, about uh, the dollar system, about uh, uh, technology and income distribution. And today we are going to tackle the other pillar uh, issue of uh, UNCTAD, that is uh, trade. Uh, this session is titled Trade Beyond uh, New Liberalism. And uh, joining us today are uh, two exceptional speakers, Susan, uh, Professor Susan Newman, who's a professor and head of economics at the Open University in UK, and Professor Arjun Jayadev, who is uh, a professor of economics at Azim Premi University, and he is also senior economist at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to Professor Newman first, and then uh, um, if there are some uh, clarif clarifying questions, uh, we will ask her. Uh, but then we will move on to uh, Professor Jayadev and open the uh, general discussion only after they have both uh, spoken. Uh, if you have questions, please type them on the Q&A. I will keep track of them and uh, eventually uh, ask them to the to the speakers. So uh, thank you very much, both uh, Arjun and Susan, for being with us. Please, Susan, uh, your floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just uh, share my presentation now, if I can find it. <laughs> I think here we are. Can you see that OK? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Now I, I just need my notes. <laughs> and then between them, I should be able to uh, start the presentation. So it's a screen. Oh, sorry about this. I've stopped screen. I'm so sorry. I've just checked all of these things and they worked, but now they've stopped. Right. One more. One more go. <laughs> uh, here we go. And I will put it on presentation mode. How's that? Okay now for my notes. So first of all, I just want to say a, a very big thank you for this invitation to give a, a brief lecture to introduce some of the issues related to the organization of trade and production in so-called global value chains, which I, I would argue is the dominant organization or form for trade today. And just to say that much of this lecture is drawn from a recently published chapter that I wrote for the Ham Oxford Handbook of Economic Imperialism, it was edited by Emmanuel Ness and Zach Cope. So what is this thing we call global value chains? And I'm sure that many of you are very aware of the term already. And there are various definitions. Um, and in its most common usage uh, today, a GVC, which I will shorten global value chains to now, from now on, describes a network of firms involved in different stages of producing and distribution and distributing a final good or service that are organized across boundaries between nation states. The value in GLOBE GBCs usually refers to value added, so the contribution by factors of production, labor and capital, to raising the value of the product above the value of raw material input. And typically this is measured as the difference between the sale price and production costs. In other words, a GBC can be viewed as a sequence of value adding activities that trace a supply chain from intermediate inputs such as bicycle parts to a final consumption good, the bicycle. And now that is a sort of more sort of common usage and definition today, but I want to draw our attention to a much earlier definition and usage as well, which comes from world systems approach. And I, I also want to just note that there are many other definitions, but I'm beginning with world systems approach as one of the earlier um, uh, earlier approaches that, that use this uh, sort of commodity chain or chain uh, construct to understand the global economy. And this was first developed by Wallerstein in the 70s and 80s who sees a commodity chain as a network of labor and production processes, whose end result is a finished commodity. The world system approach takes the commodity chain as an intermediate unit of analysis, where the totality of all commodity chains make up a world system. So it's related to structural and dependency approaches, to development theory and understand the world system is structured in an uneven and hierarchical way, such as between core and periphery. Now, it's important to state these differences in approaches to GVCs because 
a different understanding of, of, of value and, and uh, these approaches lead to very different uh, conclusions drawn, particularly in relation to development and income distribution. And I'll come back to that later on in this lecture. So in many ways, GVCs are not a new phenomenon. Uh, the globalization of production has a very long history. Um, I think one of the earliest GVCs was for saltpetre, which is uh, used in the production of gunpowder, which was established by the British East India Company back in 1600. And GVCs of processed raw materials continue to develop throughout the period of colonialism. For example, the development of cotton mills in India throughout the 19th century, and the pace of globalized production really picked up in World War, after World War II. Um, Post-war economic development took place in Western economies on the basis of large firms engaging in mass production in order to meet the requirements of mass consumption. So you will probably be familiar with the term affordism describing this particular economic system. And from the 1960s, many of these firms began to internationalize on the basis of FDI. And as wages in the US and other Western economies rose in the decades after the war, multinational co uh, corporations responded by setting up factories in low cost countries globalizing their supply chains away from high income countries. And we saw a rise of manufacturing employment across the global south, particularly in East Asia in the 1970s and 1980s. And this has been described as a new international division of labor in contrast to the more traditional international division of labor where developing countries were the supplier of raw materials. And you can see from the graph here, the period between 1970s and uh, sort of mid 1980s as a kind of increase in global value chains related to this phenomena. But you can also see that the trend in global value chains and the share of global trade really picks up from the 1990s. And it's important to note this change because it's driven by a very different organizational form, namely the reliance upon arm's length subcontracting of foreign suppliers rather than FDI directed at subsidiaries and affiliates. And this particular restructuring was made possible by politics and technological change. So trade liberalization since the 1980s has significantly reduced the costs of cross-border trade and opened up possibilities for greater fragmentation of production at discrete stages in the supply chain dispersed across multiple countries, so much, much finer international divisions of labor. Furthermore, you'll be aware there were revolutionary changes in community te uh, communication technologies and efficiencies developed in transport, such as the use of containers. And this has reduced the costs and risks associated with coordinating complex production processes at a distance and across firms. Also process of automation has facilitated the spatial reconfiguration of production as well across these sort of north-south global lines. And this has also made possible the organization of much more complex GVCs. So let me just move on to these diagrams that are hand-drawn by myself based on uh, the concepts or, or the terminology of snakes and uh, spiders that was put forward by Richard Baldwin very evocatively to discuss the organization of GVCs. And historically, these took a very sort of linear firm. So on the left, I've got a snake representing the coffee value chain, which with the, with the stripes separating out the nodes of, of production process. But of course, it is more complex than this if we start thinking about uh, the inputs as well and the inputs uh, along in, in the various segments, particularly around transportation and logistics. But we've seen with, with the, uh, a much more complex organization of GVCs in, uh, in, in relation to spiders. And many of these uh, are in high tech industries. So these are where you have components across multiple national, you know, much more complex configurations of components coming into a central assembly hub. Here we've got uh, I've depicted here the Apple assembly factory for the iPhone in Shenzhen and the legs representing the first tier uh, suppliers into that production across a number of different countries. But of course, the configurations can be much more complex than this and also modular in different ways. Um, the next thing to really note is that there's great unevenness across countries in terms of the ways firms participate in GBCs. So, uh, we'll see here, this is uh, from the World Development Report 2020, and there's great unevenness, as I mentioned before, and much of the innovation, uh, innovative GVC activities are heavily concentrated in North America and Western Europe, so those are in the darker blue. Um, and the rapid rise of manufacturing workforce since the 1980s has really occurred outside of these Western economies, 
and has taken place in China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Eastern Europe. Firms in these countries have developed into increasingly adept and technologically developed suppliers in GVCs in sectors such as electronics and machine, machinery manufacturing, whilst continuing to produce lower value added uh, manufacturing, including clothing and apparel. And the transition from low value added to high value added manufacturing activity by firms has been apparent in countries like China, India, Turkey, Poland, and Portugal since the rise of GVCs. And this has been very influential in the way in which scholars and policymakers think about potential pathways for economic development in the sort of contemporary period. And I'll come back to this later, but also just to note that the majority of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa participate in GBC primarily as suppliers of commodities still. And these trade patterns are very much born out of the ways in which British, German, Portuguese, and French colonialism developed industries such as mining and export manufacturing. So there's great geographical unevenness in types of participation. And there's also unevenness in the distribution of income and value added along GVCs that's biased in favor of high income countries. So this is a smile curve here, uh, which, uh, which depicts, which sort of helps us understand a bit the struggle for suppliers to capture value added. Um, um, and it looks at how they can add value depending on what type of productive activities are carried out. And it shows the distribution of value added along a typical GVC with high value added activities concentrated in high income countries and lower value added activities associated with production in low income countries. And what the small curve does, it, it does two things. One is it, it shows this unevenness and, and it presents a challenge for developing countries, but it also presents for some uh, a, a, a strategy or a program for development, i.e. upgrading to higher value act activities along these chains. So it underpins an argument for the imperative for firms in low income countries to upgrade to higher value activities. And here are two quotes that sort of really exemplify this particular perspective of global value chain development, which has become dominant um, in terms of World Bank thinking, for example, if you look at the last few World, ba World Development reports that really focus on this form of global value chain development. Um, but the set, which you know, the second comes from that, and the first is a much earlier quote from Gareffi, who was the one of the editors of the first sort of monograph length contribution to GVC analysis. And what does this thinking uh, reflect? So let's go back to the definitions I gave you earlier of sort of common usage and sort of earlier world systems theory approaches to value chain development, and this sort of shift or dominant thinking around global value chain development. So it reflects the shifting scope and analytical content of GVC research. And this has been documented by Jennifer Baer in 2005 and more recently by Selwyn and Leyden in 2021. It points to uh, was a mainstreaming of GVC analysis away from a political economy that was seeking to interrogate the nature of capitalist accumulation on a world scale towards an increasingly prescriptive program for economic development. Um, and with that comes the emergence of the idea of economic development through GVC upgrading. What we've seen with the latest iterations of, of this kind of global value chain development program has been the removal of the issues of power and, and hierarchical structures and, a, and an appeal to um, competitive, of comparative advantage to present, prevent, uh, present GVCD as a win-win development program which is somewhat, I think, evocative of the flying geese approach of Japanese ODA back in the 1970s. And all of this is part of a wider reorientation and neoliberal reformulation of industrial policy. And it's, it's one that's extremely optimistic about the potentiality of global value chain development to bring about widespread industrial restructuring. There are many critiques, not surprisingly, of this. Uh, the first set of critiques I would say come from are based on the lack of evidence, real evidence in support of GVCD, low value chain development. Um, the evidence for social and economic upgrading along global value chains is extremely scant and uneven. We're often presented with the best examples of success, uh, where many of the other examples are, are, are sort, of, um, sort of ignored. Um, a recent study by Paul and Timmer sought to provide a much more longer run systematic econometric study of the impact of GVC participation on economic upgrading. And they used a, a very large data set of developing countries since the 1970s and found that there was some evidence of positive productive effect for stronger GVC integration, 
but no robust evidence for any impact on employment. And that seems to corroborate some of the GVC analysis that has found, you know, uh, along with economic upgrading, there's some social downgrading, particularly in the erosion and worsening of, uh, of, of, of working conditions. Um, so by contrast, there's a very large body of, of critical GVC studies on different GVCs that found how participation by developing country suppliers had the impact of reproducing and entrenching international inequality, inequalities and in development. Another aspect uh, that's been brought up around GVCD is it leads to vertical specialization. So the specialization along a single rung of the global value chain, which means fewer domestic and intersectoral linkages that have been identified by scholars such as Caldor to be key to rapid economic development and industrial catch up. And uh, the experience of national policy making therefore really critically conditions the prospects of global value chain development in different spatial and temporal contexts. And for some good examples of this, there's a recent book by Sturgeon and his collaborators called Compressed Development, that really pragmatically tries to have a look at the, both the sort of uh, challenges as well as opportunities presented by global value chains. But we'd also need to be aware that the scope for domestic industrial policies is much reduced by the power and influence of multinational uh, lead firms as well. More critical GDC scholars, by contrast, have focused attention on power and hierarchical relations at long chains between the global north and global south and how these are created in legal, institutional, political and economic landscape of the post-colonial world. So I just want to cite a few examples of these, including the work by Selwyn, who discusses poverty chains as a, system, a systemic impoverishment of workers engaged in low cost production along GVCs. Uh, John Smith's work on super exploitation, where he equates uh, the productive restructuring on a global scale with the ushering in of super exploitation that is a forcing down of the value of labor power as a predominant form of capital labor relation. And super exploitation here refers to the reducing of wages below the value of labor power to increase the rate of surplus value. In this way, GVCs provide the architecture for increasing rates of exploitation in the global south. The monopolistic power of lead firms has allowed them to secure cheap production via supply networks without having to invest in productive capacity. And price competitions uh, between supplier firms has taken the form of cut cost cutting by increasing the rate of exploitation through various and complex systems of oppression, including uh, gendered construction of labor and a tendency towards skilled polarization that Alessandra Bazadri has outlined in her comprehensive analysis of working garment production as part of GVCs in India. So Mazari in, in, in her book reveals a complex system of subjugation and social oppression and super exploitation occurs through processes of informalization proletarianization dispossession that often tie and control the labor force across realms of production and reproduction that in invariably affects the ability of individuals workers to reproduce, reproduce their labor power as the intensity of work and impoverishment take their inevitable toil on laboring bodies. Um, so, I, I, um, so I think one aspect of this, which is the other side of the coin, so if we want to sort of summarize what I've just said in terms of super exploitation from the perspective of capital, we can look at Charlotte and Starosta's critical reinterpretation of the new international division of labor, who see the actual determinant of the emergence of this new international development of labor as the changing material conditions, which is the process of valorization of industrial capital on a global scale. So this, is the pro this process is uh, directly or indirectly minimizes the total cost of reproduction of the global working class and thus increases the rate of valorization of global capital as a whole. So you've got capital valorizing itself at, at greater rates through super exploitation on the other side of the working class and pushing this down to reducing the cost of reproduction, which for Mazadri uh, shows very real impacts on, on people's health and ability to reproduce their own labor. Another aspect um, which, I, which is closer to my work, which I hope I have time to discuss later, is the way in which uh, this restructuring together with financialization, as, which I know that you've uh, had a session on, uh, has also opened up new opportunities of, of uh, appropriation along these chains by lead firms as well. But I realize that I'm quite short of time, so those might be in the Q&A more than in this presentation. So I think I have 10 minutes left, if that's correct, to just try and wrap up some of this as well. So here is a... Um, 
a diagram that's often now used by critical uh, GVC scholars. And we know that distribution of value added along the value chain is heavily biased in favor of multinational corporations who govern them. But why is this? You know, why should it be biased towards these corporations? Well, for mainstream GBC scholars, the distribution of value added can be measured by new, new added income measured in price terms. Implicitly and in, in accord with neoclassical economics with perfect competition, the distribution of prices along the chain simply corresponds to differences in productivity or embodied expertise of production processes along the chain and hence value. So the idea here is, of course, developing uh, um, industrialized companies in the global north um, uh, capture more value because design and innovation are, are based upon much more embodied expertise and, and, and learning and knowledge. Um, so the mainstream understanding of the distribution of value added presents a potential path, as we've seen for firms operating in low value added to move towards higher value added. But for critical scholars, uh, the distribution of value added activity facilitates the value capture and appropriation by not multinational corporations downstream along these chains in ways that impede or prohibit accumulation to take place in sites of production. So some of the recent uh, critical analyses have deployed Marx's labor theory of value that allows for a divergence between value creation and price. So, you know, um, rather than value addition being reliant on, on, on how prices themselves emerge um, on the ground. And this approach recognizes the value is created by labor and production with a corresponding schematic distribution of value along GPCs that's the inverse of the small curve. So a sour smile, if you will. And the difference between the value added and, and the value imply a systematic transfer of value from the global south to the global north that's often obscured by the rationale of business economics and conventional accounting justified by neoclassical economic theory. So according to Bainman, for example, the fact that GDC activities uh, located in the global north are high value added bears actually no relation to productivity because value added in the global north can be viewed as a form of rent that is rationalized through accounting conventions. So Bayman refers to income flows into US uh, multinationals due to the high markup on low cost uh, outsourcing as fictitious value added. So in, in their contribution to, to the measurement of GDP. So when compiling the national accounts, what the US Bureau of Economic Analysis need to do is equate income to value added output. When there's no output from fictitious services manufacturing to match them, value added needs to be imputed to get the accounts to match. So the, these market prices become appear as value added when really they're markup prices that are based on monopoly power uh, of these multinational corporations. And this closely relates to, to earlier discussions on unequal exchange. So unequal exchange being seen as the systematic siphoning of value from the former colonies in the global south by capitalist class based in the imperialist centers of the global north. And this didn't cease with uh, decolonization and the end of formal subjugation. Um, Raoul Prebisch uh, was among the first to characterize the world as structured into core and periphery in this way. And, uh, and the Prebisch and Singer hypothesis of unequal exchange between core and periphery was seen to result from differences in economic structures. So the idea here was economies where manufacturing was developed were more productive and had greater scope for further productivity gains than technological change and innovation. Whilst commodity dependent former colonies were in who were in a low productivity trap um, where economic specialization was activities with limited scope for productivity increases and value addition. So for people like Prebish and Singer, unless these peripheral economies modernized and diversified, they were going to be facing a worsening in terms of trade. And this would become even more pronounced under systems of free trade. Um, another source of unequal exchange for Prebish and Singer comes from market power between industrial economies and commodity exporting economies that arise out of intersectoral differences in supply structures. So this is much more about monopolistic competition. And along a similar vein, we had Amin uh, looking at uh, you know, developing um, the theory of unequal exchange using uh, Barron and Sweezy's theory of monopoly capitalism to show how not just intersectoral differences uh, in market structures, but also the high unevenness of economic power uh, that comes with the process of concentration of, and centralization of capital has really led to this uh, process of unequal exchange, which has increasingly extended to manufactured goods in the 80s as well, particularly 
those that are based on low wages, manufacturing goods that are exported from the global south. Um, and one of, so there's a difference. So if we look at this diagram, I'm putting it up here from Ricci 2019, there's a diff, there are different ways in which unequal exchange take place that are, that come out of different types of rent extraction. So the sort of Prevision Singer intersectoral differences is, is seen as differential rent, whereas uh, the rent that stems from the monopoly power, the ability to mark up by monopolies and, and to press down on costs is seen as absolute rent through processes of exploitation. And what and uh, in a recent study by Ricci, um, who used world input output data to estimate different forms of unequal exchange and how this has you know, happened in relation to contemporary spatial patterns of production. He estimated that the global amount of value transfers in 1995, 2000, 2009, as a percentage of global value added was 1.8, 1.9 and 1.9 respectively. So not much of a change in terms of the overall value transfer, but there has been a, a major change in the composition of these value transfers in terms of their uh, constituent forms of unequal exchange. Uh, so Richie estimated in 1995 that 55.2% of the global value transfer resulted from differences in industrial specialization between countries. So this relative rent as suggested by Prevost and Singer, while 44.8% took the form of absolute rent stemming from, stemming from monopoly power. But by 2007, the quantitative significance of the two sources of value uh, transfer flipped with 64.2% from absolute rent and 35.8% from differences in industrial specialization, with the biggest change taking place from 2000 and 2007, corresponding to the sharp rise uh, of global value chains and corroborates the thesis of the international division of labor. Um, so, so really, I think that the sort of takeaway from this is that it's the, the entrenchment of in, inequality here has really come from monopolistic conditions, which then reinforce that and they originate new forms of dependency and value transfer. And as I mentioned already, Smith equates this productive restructuring on a global scale with the ushering in of super exploitation as the main uh, capital labor relation on a world scale. I realize that I'm now pretty much out of time. I think maybe I have th three, one minute maybe, I don't know, if, uh, but um, perhaps I'll just quickly outline this, uh, but not give you the, if, if you were interested in the examples, I can give those, they call, more from my own research. And that is to say that in addition to super exploitation, we've also seen, uh, seen new financial avenues of pro, uh, uh, appropriate, uh, financial avenues of appropriation along GDCs that stem from the intersecting of this productive restructuring with financialization. So scholars such as Milberg and Winkler have linked the phenomena of financialization with outsourcing and offshoring. They found an empirical relationship between that. And, uh, and what this has done, you know, the financialization of firms themselves has opened up lots of new opportunities for this financial appropriation. In my own work on coffee chains, there's some coffee here, I showed how uh, these heavily concentrated international trading companies are increasingly engaging speculative hedging and uh, earning income via financial speculation with the impact of, of, uh, of uh, pressing down uh, farm gate prices and transmitting price risks along the chains towards producers, undermining production at the site of it within the global south and accumulation there. Uh, similarly, in uh, bold and on a similar vein, bold and Durand look at these ten global retailers, the largest in the world, and found that these these were increasingly increasing their their return on equi on equity and investment through financial investments themselves. And one way in which they finance this was to extend the period of time in which they pay suppliers. So in, in a way, squeezing suppliers in order to gain free credit, part of which is then used to finance short-term uh, financial investment. And third example here is uh, of global wealth chains um, and, uh, and, off, and um, from Seabrook and Wigan, that looks at how the, uh, the sort of uh, tax havens have also increased and related to kind of strategies of multinational corporations and global value chain restructuring as well. So just to, by way of a very quick conclusion, but I can expand on any of those in the q and if people are interested. Um, I just wanted to say by way of conclusion that, you know, what we've seen is this removing of issues of power and appealing to comparative advantage by the World Bank and WTO to present uh, 
global value chain development, the win-win development program um, is, is severely narrow in its focus and, and does not take into account the multiple ways in which structure and function of GBZ have reproduced and entrenched inequality and uneven development and traditional forms of unequal exchange that arose from differences in production structures in the global north and south in the early post-colonial period in the forms of relative rent continue to play a really important role in global value transfers and we've seen also increasingly the role of absolute rent um, through stemming from monopoly uh, power um, coming from that as well so i'll end it there and uh, and hopefully these Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very, very synthetic, but but very clear uh, uh, summary of um, of the history of how global value chains came into being and developed, and uh, of uh, how uh, let's say that uh, as interacted with the, the establishment and entrenchment and reinforcement of. Uh, in terms of trade and, and relations of dependency uh, between North and the South and how a possible maybe uh, relation between South-South regions can, can uh, uh, develop. I I would like uh, to, so it's true that we did uh, address the topic of the financialization on the second day of the, of the conference, of the summer school, but uh, in reality, or we mostly talked about it uh, in terms of uh, its inherent instability, and um, um, I mean, in terms of, of how finance influences uh, stability and macroeconomic policies as a, as a consequence. Uh, but we did not address what you were just saying. That is uh, how financialization is creates also uh, incentives and uh, inducements in terms of what is uh, of investments or modes of production and uh, by its uh, holdings and property of the different pieces of the global value chain. So if you, that and that's a very important aspect of financialization. It's not just the instability part. It's not just the global finance that we are uh, used to think about, but there's a deeper uh, influence of finance on production that uh, you just hinted at. And perhaps it would be useful if you could say a few more words uh, just before we move on with the, with the second presentation about that. I would be happy to do that, but I didn't want to sort of cut into Artun's time or, or abuse my position here a little bit. But yeah, I'd be really happy to do that But because I would argue, actually, it's really interesting the way you frame financialization. It's been discussed so far in the summer school because my approach to financialization is that it has to be rooted in understanding the restructuring of capital and production itself. So you can't understand financialization without understanding how finance enters in the industry. And that's really the basis. That's the qualitative shift that we've seen. And everything else for me stems from that. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways in which financialization is understood. And there's also a lot of debate around what its usefulness is. But empirically, I think, it's re few, very few people deny that, you know, increasingly economic decisions made by owners of capital has, it, has been increasingly in the interest of expanding finance capital. So, so, uh, so this, from the perspective of the firm, for example, this would be much more around the, the role of stock markets and, and, and uh, shareholder maximization and uh, for, for uh, and, and different sources and uses of profits, as Milberg and Winkler would put it. So you might be a firm that is a manufacturing firm, so a multinational corporation that's meant to be manufacturing, but really you're not invested in the bricks and mortar and machinery of manufacturing. You outsource all of that production, but you do have a balance sheet that includes a great deal of financial assets. Um, we saw this, um, you know, we saw this at the uh, cusp of the financial crisis of 2007 and 9, and for example, with General Motors, whose balance sheet looked as much like an investment fund as it as anything else. Um, so, so this clearly changed the motivations for for these firms, and there's a connection between you know shifting towards uh, shorter term sources and uses of profits. Um, but still reliant somewhat on, on this process of production through outsourcing and, and the sort of high margins that these monopolistic firms can, can have. So 
the experience, for example, that I was talking about from coffee is that, you know, if you look at trade, coffee trading companies, they're really you know, the top five, I think, coffee trading companies, which are largely privately owned. Um, they, con they control over 50% of global coffee trade. And they make a very large, you know, still make a lot of money from, from the trade itself and the margins that come from that, but they've increasingly derived an income from their ability to themselves speculate on, on uh, international commodity markets. What that has done, and that also relates to what you might have seen the other day around financialization, particularly pension funds, for example, and institutional investors, and how the provision of art for old age and health and insurance is increasingly tied to, to these markets. Um, we see, you know, so commodity markets are very, very attractive to various pension funds and institutional investors, as well as these very large uh, wealth management corporations like Vanguard and BlackRock, who are now really, really, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of studies now that show how these particular players are changing the prices, are able to affect prices, uh, uh, to, you know, appearing on these exchanges, which are themselves increasingly used as a benchmark for the physical commodities, which has a direct implication on those growers on the ground who don't have access um, to these financial avenues of appropriation either. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the second speaker, Arjun Jayadev, please. Great, uh, I hope this works. Can, can people see this, uh, see my screen? Okay, so let me try with the. All right. Um, so thanks very much, Ursula, and uh, thanks, Susan. It was actually actually a lot of fun to to listen to. Um, uh, I was kind of delighted when I was asked to speak on a panel on called Trade Beyond Liberalism, Neoliberalism, because I had written a paper called Beyond Neoliberal Trade, and um, all I'm going to do today is really sort of explic explicate and uh, expand upon that paper. Um, and if anything um, is not clear, I, I just urge you to, to go back to this. I believe it's part of the notes for the overall summer school. Um, I have about 15 or 20 minutes and all I thought I would do is sort of um, uh, outline what I think uh, are the kind of still the key theoretical questions surrounding uh, neoliberal trade and uh, its critics as it were. And um, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do in the next 15, 20 minutes is to sort of outline are uh, the arguments that we have so far. Uh, <coughs> we have um, the notion of trade and free trade, of course, of course uh, as uh, economists, that's not something like a bread and butter stuff, but I think it's, it's important to, to identify uh, really the period of what we're calling neoliberal trade or neoliberal trade theory. Um, uh, and that really is a particular specific moment, you know, uh, reinvigorated after the 1970s. Uh, we've worked in the World Bank and uh, you know, in uh, uh, elite uh, universities and so on. Um, the work of Anne Kruger, Jagdeep Bhagwati, Bela Balasa, etc., uh, all of whom really uh, were attacking the notion of some sort of government management of trade. Like fundamentally, the last, uh, you know, if you, if you will, between say 1970 and 1990, an enormous amount of effort was uh, devoted to trying to understand the theoretical implications uh, and try to really fundamentally remove barriers to trade. Um, and the arguments at least initially were the, the arguments that we're all uh, familiar with, the arguments from static efficiency, that uh, you know, there are a lot of hardware triangles that you lose out if you, if you impose tariffs or if you impose any sort of quotas. Um, and if, but over time, that also shifted to notions of dynamic efficiency in, in some sense that that uh, uh, moving to a system of free trade or investment, investor protection more generally is consonant with good governance. And uh, overall, if you want to have an economy that's growing, a developing economy that, that is uh, playing by the rules, uh, you ought to move to a system of much more uh, free trade, free trade understanding, particularly in terms of removal, removal of certain barriers. Uh, at the same time, this is, at, this is occurring, uh, East Asian success was seen as uh, as a vindication, and of course, many years uh, of um, work has gone into disabusing people of the notion that was very neoliberalism that was behind the East Asian success. But nevertheless, that was used just as the uh, as the relative uh, unsuccess of pure import subsidies in Latin America was used as an 
an argument for greater trade openness. And then finally, I would say the high water point is about 94 with the World Trade Organization and accession by virtually all countries. I think it's very interesting here to notice, uh, you know, specifically the kind of provisions that were there in the WTO, which went well beyond the notion of simply free trade, but also broadly things like intellectual property and investor protection, which were specifically very different sorts of um, uh, institutional changes in the, in the international economy, uh, kind of devoted to ensuring investor protection, a very different sort of mode of thinking about um, international trade. Right? Um, and so that really became sort of the dominant way of thinking about it. And I would argue it's still dominant, if you will, uh, as, as the default mode of thinking about how we should organize our international economy. Um, I should ha hasten to add that uh, there's a lot of movement in theory, and uh, uh, I would say that's still the case for uh, uh, international trade that's made again and again is the, is the old case based on comparative advantage uh, as a first approximation. But if you see the kind of uh, uh, movements all the way, I would say, from the 90s, but keep continuing on uh, today. Uh, it has very little to do with, with the old stories. Uh, so new trade theory, for example, is about uh, increasing returns, location advantages, um, and so on. And that is very clearly a case for intervention, a case for industrial policy, and so on. And people like Paul Krugman and others who are originators of this would agree with that kind of notion. Um, and these are the modern understandings of why we have particular forms of trade. Of course, um, New new trade theory, as it's called, very uh, uh, unimaginatively named, um, is even further afield of talking about firm location advantages, nothing at all about the kind of uh, neoliberal trade that we, we're used to. Uh, and as Susan's also pointed out, a lot of work has gone into thinking about global value chains and how it is structured uh, as, as kind of descriptors of, of how actually trade occurs, which is very different from the, the classical. Uh, kind of uh, justification, if you will, for overall trade. So it's in the main neoliberal case um, is the same as the old Ricardian model. Now, of course, uh, 200 years ago, you could argue that you know uh, maybe there's some superficial plausibility about um, about Portugal having the ability to produce uh, wine and and England having the ability to produce cloth. Now, of course, in a more, more modern economy, it's even less uh, less plausible. Nevertheless, it's if you will the basic substrate of thinking about uh, neoliberal trade. Um, I would argue that there's no one um, uh, sort of body of criticism, which is uh, the alternative. In fact, there's many, uh, but we could, we could roughly characterize them as two sorts of bodies of work. Um, one is the argument uh, from development. Uh, and the other is the argument from macroeconomic stability. What do I mean by the argument from development? Right from the outset, um, you know, from Alexander Hamilton to Liz to others, the notion that in fact uh, trade was uh, free trade was actually an impediment to development, and that one needed to actually think about manage trade as a way to go go about the economy uh, about economic management has been something that has had a long history. And of course, dependency theory is a, is, an, is a, a kind of key. Uh, movement in in, in theory, uh, about thinking about the international economy as actually an impediment um, to, to, to development. And in more modern times, you have Alice Amston and Hajim Shang and others who have been basically um, talking about these, these, these same stories, these same sort of narratives in more modern contexts. And the ways in which, uh, as Hajim Shang uh, memorably, put, memorably puts it, um, uh, the, the current economic structure kicks away the ladder, which uh, uh, which in fact was essential to development for uh, the currently the advanced uh, economies. So that's one set of theories. Um, the other set, I would argue, uh, um, comes from the argument from macroeconomic stability or instability. And what happens when you enter the international economy? What actually adjusts? Now, this, this, the idea that you know you should, uh, as as Keynes put it, disembarrass yourself from. Uh, too much integration because of macroeconomic stability. That's an old argument, at least uh, 80, 90 years old, uh, but it comes back again and again and again. And modern day post Keynes and theory I can still really have the more um, uh, fully developed way of thinking about this. Of course, people like uh, Yanis Varoufakis, when he talks about global minotaur and, and surplus recycling mechanisms, argues fundamentally that the global system is not set up 
to maintain macroeconomic So I'll say that these, these two bodies of theory still constitute, if you will, this, the most powerful criticisms of Miller group trade and, um, and will continue to do so because they have such a long history. Right. So what's the argument from development? Um, the orthodox treatment teaches comparative advantage uh, as determining uh, and should be and, and should determine the international division of labor because this is efficiency maximizer. Uh, um, but if you if you take the argument from development, national development rather than the international division of labor should be the ultimate goal of of uh, whatever policies that you that you actually implement, right? And this is really, if you if you take the historical record of catch up industrialization in the United States, Germany, and East Asia, it seems it seems fairly obvious that it was never based purely on old school comparative advantage, but really thinking about ways in which one could integrate into global economy. So, uh, according to this set of kind of theories or arguments, um, the central question about the international economy is not about optimal allocation, but really whether uh, we're setting up systems which allows for a suitable en environment for the survival and growth of domestic firms and industries. Um, and in doing so, does the integration of the global economy hold back the productive capacity of nations or does it uh, enhance that, right? Um, now, uh, clearly neoliberal trade is very strongly against that and uh, would question that really fundamentally on its own pre premises. Um, and here it's not really simply the matter of infant industries, which, uh, you know, was the original, if you will, uh, Hamilton list and so on argument. Um, but really that, uh, I would say the last 15, 20 years has seen an active enforcing of a global div uh, division of labor. Uh, I think the most simple kind of example of this is to think about uh, intellectual property, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, uh, in ensuring, for example, that uh, country after country have to abide by the TRIPS agreement, uh, that's you know, which was embedded in, in the WTO, um, it ensures that certain things which the developed economies actually took into account themselves is not something that that uh, developing economies now really have access to. Uh, the Indian story and uh, the development of a pharmaceutical uh, industry in the 70s, when we actually got rid of our patents. Um, is actually very instructive because you have uh, uh, a very vibrant, very important industry globally. Uh, the NSF has called uh, you know, India the, the, uh, the pharmacy of the developing world. It only was possible in an environment in which one was able to push against uh, you know, the kind of restrictions, investor restrictions that are, that are there currently in, in the global system. Um, now, I hasten to add that uh, the argument for development is not an anti-trade argument. Rather, it's an argument that trade and integration are necessary, but on one's own terms. Uh, that, uh, that if you're going to enter the global economy, you do it only after your firms and industry have, have the capacity to engage in ineffective ways around this. All right, moving to the second set of arguments, the argument for macroeconomic man management. Um, I think it's important to realize that there's a dual role that uh, trade theory is, is, is providing. One is to say that we should have an international division of labor. And the second is to say that it is actually possible to have it without a lot of macroeconomic instability. Um, and the argument is very simple. Uh, that whatever labor and other resources are withdrawn from areas in which the country does not have comparative advantage, um, exchange rates adjust so that these resources will be fully employed in the areas where it does. Um, what does that mean? It means that, for example, one does not need to worry about, uh, let's say you're, you're in the US, you need not worry about uh, your economy becoming less competitive in terms of, say, car production. You will see a natural movement away of resources into the areas in which you actually are productive or, or you have comparative advantage. Uh, and so really, in the end, questions of employment and so on are, can neatly be separated from uh, trade. In our country's GDP, employment, savings, investment pay, rates, they determine the domestic factors and trade really has no effect if you according to the orthodox theory. And the mechanism for that is really basically the idea that deficits are self-correcting um, and a flexible exchange rate between countries will allow for that. Right. Uh, of course, in the real world, that is not what we see, right? Um, what we see shifts are far too slow and inconsistent in exchange rates to prevent major trade flows from spilling back uh, into the domestic economy. And 
clearly a lot of what happens with respect to political economy surrounds these particular facts, that, that in fact, uh, you do not have smooth adjustments. Um, people spoke uh, in this panel previously about cross-border financial flows and financialization, and that may be much more important in determining uh, in, uh, exchange rates in the short term than any sort of real border, real um, real sector flows and trade flows, right? Um, so, so in that sense, the, the kind of mechanism, the core mechanism by which you're supposed to have adjustment and macroeconomic stability, that falls away. Uh, but even on its own terms, uh, trade flows do not re respond to changes in exchange rates in the way that theory predicts. The argument, of course, that you have, the implicit argument is that if you have um, uh, uh, exchange rate appreciation, you will have exports grow and you're going to be able to, to correct for trade deficits as a result of that. But uh, the, the fundamental requirement for that, as everyone knows, is that the martial learner conditions have to hold and empirical evidence after empirical evidence suggests that it doesn't. So what does that actually mean? It means that the older post Keynesian uh, approaches, such as the balance of payments constraint growth, really still obtain now. And what we mean by that means that uh, if, you're, if a country booms and it runs a trade deficit, it is not going to be the case that exchange rate depreciation is going to be sufficient to bring things back into, into balance. Rather, what you're going to actually see is that countries have to actually have deflation of some sort or the other. Um, uh, if, if exchange rates don't adjust, a uh, nice way to ensure trade deficits actually come back into, into uh, uh, balance is to actually induce a recession. And you see that kind of logic actually there uh, in the global economy still. Of course, finally, there's no surplus recycling mechanism. That's what Varoufakis and others have spoken about, um, which, which could help, uh, uh, you know, balancing uh, trade deficits and trade surplus countries. This is something that has been there for many years as, as a desideratum of a new global economy. However, we do this from Keynes and to so think, think, to think about adjustments actually being on trade surplus uh, economies. I'm going to skip over this because I've spoken a little bit about this, but we can come back to this issue about accounting identities and the ways in which actually adjustment does occur. So I'm going to really, you know, as I said, uh, um, this is a very short 15 minutes sort of presentation into all of this, and that maybe allows, allows us a little bit of time to, to think about uh, these ideas going forward. Uh, at the current juncture, from 2010 on, Eileen Gregor has a very nice term to think about the way that uh, the IMF, World Bank, international organizations are thinking about these things, is what she calls the product, productive incoherence in uh, the way that people are thinking about the global economy. Capital controls, for example, are now much more closer than they were, let's say, 15, 20 years ago. And there are new cases for trade management. At the same time, I think it's important to realize that uh, we're undergoing uh, maybe not a very uh, happy moment uh, where uh, the liberalism, if you will, of the last you know, 40, 50 years, or at least the presumed liberalism of the last 40, 50 years, is challenged in the last 10 years by the growth of nationalism uh, across the board. Um, uh, now, what, what does that mean? You know, thinking a little bit about Susan's presentation, rebuilding after COVID may be less reliant on global uh, supply networks, but also at a fundamental basis, the notion that we ought to have uh, a fully open liberal international economy is something that I don't think uh, uh, economies uh, accept or, or policymakers accept uh, so naturally, especially uh, in, in the develop, developing world currently. And at the same time, the biggest challenges that we're facing are global challenges. So, uh, you know, that's climate change, of, you know, uh, public goods such as financial stability or public health. So really rethinking how we're going to think about trade, uh, the management of trade, uh, the global uh, trading regime and so on is a global challenge. Um, and it's uh, happening at a time in which I think uh, we, are, we, are, we are actually seeing um, a movement away from cooperation to potentially uh, a, a much more uh, combative and unclear set of uh, circumstances than we've had in the past. So I'll stop. Thank you very much. A very, very comprehensive uh, uh, summary of uh, trade theory and of uh, its implications today.
uh, in fact, I mean, uh, the very last slide is uh, so full of, uh, you know, hints about this current situation that uh, I would like you uh, to develop some of them a little bit, especially perhaps um, the aspect related to, uh, but that's something I guess I will have, I will want to ask Susan as well uh, later on uh, about, um, you know, is, is the world fragmenting uh, right now? So are we looking at a deglobalization movement at this time? And if so, when you talk about nationalism, are you more talking of a different type of uh, protectionism or or other type of uh, trade agreements? Uh, in the you know you know is that a positive thing or a negative thing? So so. Um... I, I think the moment is actually, I, I really liked Eileen's uh, phrase of productive incoherence, right? I mean, uh, there are the, multiple things going on at the same time. And the public pronouncements of many governments is actually far more, um, uh, it's, not, it's not overtly protectionist, far more suspicious and skeptical of a global trade regime than they were in the past. At the same time, um, there's movements, there have been movements over the last 15, 20 years, which are WTO plus, uh, you know, trips provisions plus, you have a lot of free trade agreements, you have a lot of arguments for um, allowing, for example, private arbitration, which was not even there in the World Trade Organization. So uh, I think there are two, two movements. One, at one level, there still continues to be this movement towards, if you will, uh, for want of a word, more, more, um, a more neoliberal world in which actually have investor protection and private trade flows actually has been uh, the most important thing to protect. At the same time, I think it's also clear that for country after country, they cannot support that uh, to their own populist population. So there is a sort of tension around that. Uh, I don't know which way it's going to go, uh, go about. I do think that that country after country is thinking about ways to not be so hyper dependent on, on value, to value chains. Uh, how that actually uh, plays out, you know, in country to country will depend. I know this is not a very satisfactory answer, but I, I do think there's a sort of incoherence currently in the global economy around those points. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that something we've heard uh, in uh, the other sessions the past days as well, related to each time the different topic we were talking about uh, was that, well, you have a world that's evolving and that evolution brings about usually uh, an intensification of imbalances and dependence between North and South, but it also brings about some opportunities. And so those you need to be able to grasp those mm -hmm. and you need to find some kind of balance between the things. And so I guess that, that that's the problem, how to, you, how to manage the, the transition and how to how, how can policymakers in the south uh, not be trapped in a situation where that's the context they find themselves in and uh, there's not they, or at least they feel there's not much they can do whereas the, there might be a possibility of a south led alternative so to speak that's something a little anticipation of something that we'll, we are writing about in the upcoming tdr but uh, i would like to know what, what uh, susan thinks about it and then uh, arjun and susan if you want to also respond to the previous question about fragmentation from your point of view so are you am i coming in now is that okay sorry so the two first question is uh deglobalization is it happening? And the second one is about self-led or different forms of corporation. Alternative, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll try, I've had a little look at the Q&As and I might be able to weave some of that into this answer actually. In terms of deglobalization, I mean, is it happening? Um, I don't think it is. I think that if we look at that graph of GBCs, yeah, that, I mean, the rate at which they're increasing is, is declined, but they're still increasing in their share and they're increasing overall. Um, I think there is a restructuring, there's been a consolidation of GBCs, particularly after the global financial crisis, where previously these multinational firms were like, <coughs> sorry, um, outsourcing to multiple suppliers, placing them in competition with each other, and that just became really intractable. So they had to consolidate. Sorry, I've got something in my throat. I'm just gonna have to put my microphone off and cough properly. 
so you don't have to hear it. Oh, sure, <laughs> no problem. No, no, take your time. Maybe uh, if uh, I can... No, I can okay. carry on now, probably, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, there were there has been some consolidation in terms of the number of, of, of suppliers that are used by multinationals. I think that has changed, and that provides some opportunities for workers, I think, particularly to address some of the power relations, because you've got bigger concentrations of workers. And ultimately, I think that's the key, really, is we're trying to redress these power relations between this very concentrated capital and the and more democratic forms of economic organization. Um, now, in terms of the movement themselves, a lot of the deglobalization so-called movement has been extremely reactionary and right wing, and this, you know, around new protectionism, as I think you, you know, you're aware of. And I think it's really important to differentiate that from the sort of anti-globalization types of discussions that were happening in the early 2000s, late 90s, which were anti-capitalist as well and anti-exploitation and had a very different view of the way in which North-South relations worked. And that does need to be updated and understood, I think, here as well. Um, can regionalism and other forms of cooperation help and work? I think absolutely they can, but I think they need to be careful because I think once again, the centrality of power relations need to be there. So one example I've been looking at increasingly has been the nature of Southern African regional development and the development of regional value chains in the Southern African region. That has been, you know, and that's a South-South corporation. It's seen as a, as, as a sort of shared prosperity, but really, you know, more critical scholars. And, and actually, if you have a look at the specific um, sectors and also the way in which the value is transferred within the region, it's all in the interest of South African capital. So all you've got there is, a, you know, another reproduction of these and entrenched inequalities within a region, which might be called something imperialist or something like that. So I'd be really interesting to look at the GDR about once you've written it around the scope for that. But I do think uh, cooperation is key, but I think it has to happen in a democratic way and it has to be around probably workers oriented. And just to link with the deglobalization aspect of that as well, a lot of the right wing rhetoric is around the erosion of wages in the global north. And I think to understand that they, the erosion of wages in the global north and exploitation in the global south are connected phenomena is a really important part of trying to sort of shift towards a more equitable kind of approach. Thank you, Arjun. So um, I'm, I'm broadly in agreement with Susan about uh, everything here. The, so, you know, I'm not the one who's looking for the GDF, but I, I, um, I, I do think that there is going to be a movement towards thinking about more, you know, less um, uh, vulnerability to, to uh, global supply chains. I think that, that, that is already underway. It is true, uh, and I think she is absolutely right, that there is no deglobalization yet. Um, and it's not even clear yeah, how far you can actually go with that because productive structures, uh, to change productive structures, you can't do it overnight. But I, I do think that um, uh, if, if, if you will, the, the political background, the political sort of acceptance, if you will, of uh, the final movement towards a completely global trade, uh, liberal, uh, trade regime, that has fallen away. Now, what actually uh, replaces it and whether it will be a sort of much more bilateral kind of, a real political kind of set of um, uh, political agreements and trade agreements, that may be the, 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 the way that you'll see things going in the next you know, few years. But certainly the idea of, um, of uh, uh, you know, as, as I said, you know, a completely liberal uh, trade regime is, is out the window. Now, having said that, it's not clear at all that um, the kind of things that Susan and I would hope for, which is a much more fair set setup in a global uh, a global trade setup, um, is something that is actually at the forefront of things. Now, obviously, there are certain movements which are around um, trying to ensure that. For example, around IP, and you know, we've had we had all, all that, that big debate about getting rid of patents during the the, the pandemic and so on. Um, but it's just as likely that you might see uh, you know far less uh, 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 worker-friendly kind of agreements coming about through FTAs and so on. So uh, it, again, I'm, I'm not sure which way it's going to go, 
Um, but uh, what I'm really hope, hoping is that we don't look back to uh, 1994 and the WTO as some sort of halcyon days, you know, uh, which is possible. <laughs> so. Well, the role of the WTO has changed, uh, however. Uh, do you want to comment a bit on, on that, perhaps? Uh, we go again with Susan and then Arjun. I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to discuss the role of WTO fully. I mean, other than just very broadly saying that its relevance has diminished largely because of the move towards more what they call it, spaghetti bowl of agreements rather than the former. But um, Arjun probably has more detail and understanding of that. Well, um, perhaps, I mean, one follow up question to that is uh, has to do with the um, with the fact of uh, climate change policies and uh, how, you know, how, well, we've seen there has been a, you know, a walking back from even the small commitments that uh, were taken uh, after the COP and, uh, uh, but at the same time, there is sort of a, a risk arising for uh, for countries in the south that this is used in a protect protectionist uh, way without uh, you know allowing for compensatory finance to uh, uh, to come along uh, so yeah perhaps uh, yeah, that that's a better question for you <laughs> Who wants to go first? So, so say a little bit more. I, you mean the uh, technology transfer around uh, around climate change? Is that what you you're referring to specifically, and and uh, impediments to that? Yeah, it's sort of it's been called yeah. green shoring. Or... Yes, yeah. I mean, again, this is something that I've you know, a very little uh, knowledge of, but I do understand that, um, I mean, if one is to take the analogy with medicine and public health to, to you know, say more productive technologies, which are public, global public goods, um, it seems to me very clear that um, one of the big limitations that we have uh, globally is, is uh, knowledge and technology um, and its management, right? And that, uh, WTO form the floor, um, FTAs will, you know, raise that as, as well. And um, to the extent that there's actually civil society movements and so on, uh, pushing very, very hard to make sure that knowledge, uh, especially around things like climate change uh, technology and transfer, being actually as free as possible. Um, that, that's actually an extremely productive and, and important space to be uh, involved in. And We've known how these things have been in the past, right? I mean, um, if, if there is money to be made, there will be an enclosure of the commons. Right? So uh, to the extent that we, you know, we've learned from 94, I'm hopeful that over the next you know, uh, decade or so, whenever these kind of questions about frontier technologies come into to, to play again, that, that we have a little bit more, um, shall we say, a progressive kind of response to that. Susan, would you like to add something? I don't think I've got anything to add to that. Um, well, um, I mean, uh, sorry, I guess kind of lost in the, the thing. Um, I suppose, uh, I mean, one, one important point of this discussion is that, uh, you know, uh, Something that has always been at the core of UNCTAD work since uh, its very first co conference, 1964, is that uh, trade uh, discussion on trade cannot uh, be separated for it from uh, discussion of international finance and international liquidity. And uh, and your uh, analysis of trade has uh, once again confirmed, and these two aspects are particularly interrelated. 
uh, we've discussed during the summer school about the role of the, the dollar uh, and uh, whether that is uh, vanishing uh, as well uh, together with the globalization. You seem to have a different, a slightly different view from uh, the speakers that addressed this uh, topic before in the in first day of the conference where uh, Jimmy Galbraith and Jayati Gosh, uh, who were a bit more uh, uh, I guess uh, optimistic or, or about the possibility of a deglobalization, but not necessarily optimistic about the, the direction where that could could lead. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, any additional comments. I couldn't possibly disagree, Jati Gosh or <laughs> or James Galbraith, um, but. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think it's really difficult. Again, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert in 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 the in macroeconomics or the role of the dollar, but I do think that to the extent that corporate power is still concentrated in the United States, and that you know trade is still mostly you know kind of uh, coordinated by U.S. multinational firms, will have an will have an impact on the role of the U.S. dollar. Um, particularly around the sort of valuation of things. Um, Arjun will be a much more expert at answering that. But I also think there is a question around the valuation of stuff in general. Um, and I just wanted, I don't know, I'm going to be a bit, I've used my position as being able to speak to answer one of the questions in the Q&A actually, which has something to do with intellectual property as well and monopoly power. Because one of the big question, big things, up, the main point I wanted to make really, which draws from Ricci's work is that not so much that this value transfer is going on, but it's qualitatively changed. And that qualitative change has a lot more to do with corporate power than it does to difference in productivity, which historically would have meant, you know, more industrial policy and catch up industrialization. But what we've got now is monopoly power. And that links to one of the questions I think was to say, well, why is R&D seen from a Marxian perspective as low value added or low value compared to production? And I think the thing, the thing is because yes it takes a lot of mental work it's a lot to r d is expensive but once you have it the marginal cost of using it in production is, is zero and uh, so it, for each unit of production that that becomes zero and the only way that from profit from that is to control as as arjun has said is to control that intellectual property and to maintain that and that's very much entrenched in the in the issues of, of corporate power um, as well Well, we somehow had this discussion about data yesterday, um, but uh, one of the comments by the speakers was that uh, if you actually have uh, only very concentrated markets with very few firms that uh, are the ones who control the technology, not, not only in terms of IP, but also in terms of uh, knowing what to do with this data, we were talking about data specifically, even if data itself is public, then the use of it and the capacity to use the platform is going to be uh, skewed as well. I completely agree. I mean, um, I think it's actually interesting to think about, uh, you know, about knowledge is transfer, it's use and so on. Um, you know, if you take a very basic sort of, very uh, simple solo uh, approach, right? And you say that, uh, then the biggest, what we've known is that the biggest, uh, uh, the thing that's most important is to uh, have technology, uh, you know, to, to be able to use uh, technology in your, uh, in your production, you know, the A in, in the, in the, the, the solo production function being so central. Uh, and if you assume that knowledge is actually something that you transfer in, uh, with zero marginal cost, it's the, the most significant thing that you can do to create global integration, to, uh, to, to create uh, the possibility of uh, faster growth, poverty reduction, is to transfer technology and transfer know-how as well. Now, of course, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, the... Um, uh, it's, it's not simply just say getting rid of a patent. You have to actually find ways to make sure that, that, that actually production technologies are able to be transferred. Data protection is one of those kind of, uh, you know, very, very cruel um, additions that people 
thought of. And there was this, there was a debate a few years ago about um, data protection and what it does, you know, specifically with respect to to uh, pharmaceuticals. I think it's worthwhile just going over that that debate for a little bit, um, which was that even if if a patent is invalidated. Uh, in order to, you know, for, for medicines, in order to show by equivalence, you have to actually be able to use the person's, the, the, the original company's data. And if that data is protected, you couldn't use it, and therefore you couldn't actually produce the generic drug. So there's a whole suite of things that we need to do in the modern economy because of the way legally uh, systems are set up to make sure that the actual value of, of technology and know-how is transferred. Same thing happened with respect, for example, to... Um, the notion that you know uh, mRNA vaccines that we had uh, that were available, the mRNA vaccines uh, that they would drop the patent, but it was still not something that could be used because there's a lot of know-how. And as it turned out, that know-how actually existed uh, a little bit. So it so it turns out that that's not you know such a big constraint. But on top of that, uh, the, the kind of natural thing that, that any sort of uh, enlightened policymaker would, would think about is pay people in order to transfer the know-how. It's so central to actually making sure that you are ramping up a vaccine production globally. Uh, why would you hold back on that? Right. So, so in fact, one has to think about this not simply as just patent, so, but really about transferring technology overall and transferring knowledge overall. So I agree very, very much with, with this notion that in fact, there's many things besides just the patent protection. I hope that answers the question at least addresses some mm -hmm. of the Yes, 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 absolutely. It's very interesting. Uh, I know you're uh, an expert on pharmaceuticals as well. Uh, that was uh, another big disappointment of the last MC12, I guess. Um, Susan, do, would you like to add anything about this? Um, there were some questions uh, related to your presentation specifically in the, in the chat. I uh, kind of lost track of it, uh, one had to do with the value uh, of R&D in Marxian terms. Uh, would you like perhaps to answer to that? Oh, I thought, I, I thought, I think I squeezed an answer to that by shifting the conversation earlier a little bit, which is to do with, you know, yes, whilst it requires a lot of uh, labor, time and expertise to, to perform uh, R&D, once the knowledge is there, its application to the production of things is the marginal cost of it applying that is, 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 is zero, close to zero. Um, know how, you know, as long as you have know how, as Arjun mentioned earlier. So, in that way, it, it's not, you know, it's not something you don't have to produce a new bit of RD each time you produce another thing. So, the, the, val the value creation is not sort of, you know, related to the amount produced, as it were. And the only reason why the value added is large is because of protectionism or the ability to control and protect that knowledge um, and technology. So that, that's really the point I wanted to make, which is linked to the, the, the issue of um, the issue of, of kind of corporate power and who controls what. And that relates to some of the other questions that I can see here on there. I don't know if I should um, mention that one, one person said about industrial specialization causing unequal exchange. Um, and whilst the yes, difference in productivity do do that, I think the point I was trying to make was that that's become a less less important aspect of unequal exchange compared to monopoly. That, that unequal exchange stems from monopoly control. And the other question around like kind of can people gain uh, equally from participation? And again, the answer it really depends on the relative power relations. Again, so I think there are something I'd like to see scope in is, is sort of cooperative or um, global value chains. And I think in the past, we saw something close to that with the international commodity agreements, for example, where there was some cooperation between consuming and producing countries to come to a price that was, you know, that was a mutual benefit, for example. So I think, yeah, I think again, these are all, power seems to be the answer to every question that I ever get given. Oh, I'm ever asked. Um, but I think largely it is around that. Yeah, I think, again, all of these questions need to be captured within understanding what the particular power dynamics within these chains and across the global economy are. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. Um, I guess that uh, um, is there any other comment that you would like to make, uh, Arjun? 
uh, please. You know, I, did, I did want to say something uh, that you know I didn't have time to really touch upon, so that which you kind of actually gave an opening to about financial globalization you know, and and the sort of uh, uh, invocation of trade questions and and financial globalization questions. Um, and I mentioned this a little briefly when we were talking about the surplus recycling mechanisms, right? Uh, and the fact that you know the global trading system doesn't have something like this. Um, now, to some extent, the US trade deficit, at least for the last you know 20, 25 years, has been a sort of mechanism whereby you know you, you, you trade surplus countries can actually park their uh, uh, trade surpluses and the US will keep running a trade deficit, right? And so there's old kind of questions that we have, different questions that we have. Um, I think it's really inst instructive to think about the ways in which actually economies have tried to manage these kind of uh, questions of financial globalization. In fact, almost to the detriment of, me, of uh, uh, you know, uh, trade and, and real sector improvement. Now think a little bit about um, uh, reserve accumulation that by uh, developing economies, right? That's been such an incredibly uh, visible uh, kind of response to financial globalization. No country wants to be caught with the, what happened in the Asian financial crisis. And so you have these gigantic pools of money, uh, which are sitting as results in, in China or in India or others. Now, obviously, a much better first order uh, uh, kind of uh, policy would be to, to, to try to regulate global financial capital flows in the first place, so actually mean to you know, much more stability in exchange rates and therefore you know, allow for trade accumulation to happen. But in the absence of that, you have this extremely inefficient but uh, completely understood self-insurance policy of, of, uh, of um, uh, you know, reserve accumulation. Now, I think this is just symptomatic of the ways in which actually countries know they're going to have to integrate into the global economy. Financial globalization is, is there. The cat is kept strenuously kind of guarded by, if you will, the, the uh, you know, the, the global trade regime. Um, and, and as a result, the, you know, you have to do all these kind of contortions to make sure that you're able to actually integrate into the trade. The, yeah, trade, a trade can actually integrate in the ways that you actually wanted to, to do so. So when, you know, you mentioned Charity and Jamie and others, to the extent that I think, uh, Country after country is really thinking now that uh, maybe they, they really don't want to integrate so extensively in the in the global financial system, and that there, there are possibilities again. This uh, Eileen's uh, notion of uh, productive incoherence, using capital controls in more effective ways. Um, there may be ways in which you actually so slowly see a movement towards a slightly different way of thinking about uh, the global trade regime. So I just wanted to mention that in his response to, to something that you had said earlier. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, our keynote speaker was uh, Perry Merlew, whom uh, you know, uh, um, he, and he was emphasizing how the the Fed has become much more able, and that's something you also wrote about in the past, is that the central banks have become extremely uh, capable of managing certain situations. However, I mean, for sure, especially when it comes to controlling systemic problems uh, at an international level, so, you know, focusing mostly on the bigger countries and on the core of the financial system, uh, etc., uh, but um, they've been able often to control market freezes, mar money market freezing, freezes and so on. But when it comes to uh, the expansionary part of the global credit cycle, that they cannot control. And that's very disruptive too. Right, yeah. So I think to the extent that, you know, uh, one, one has to think about the global system, you can't really separate the trade regime, the global financial regime, central banking, all of these are going to be part of a new architecture. I agree very much with that. Yeah, a lot of work uh, to do there. And <laughs> I think that uh, your uh, your presentations and your, your answers were indeed uh, very helpful to clarify these complex arguments. Um, and uh, I know that uh, uh, in a, uh, 15 minutes or so, there is also a follow-up uh, session of uh, the YSI students and then um, the audience in general. Uh, 
Um, so I encourage the audience to register to that and uh, and participate to the discussion to continue uh, talking about these uh, topics. And you too, uh, Susan and Arjun, if you wish, uh, you don't have to, but if you wish, you can you can join the discussion there. Uh, just to conclude, I would also uh, like to remind everyone that tomorrow we have our final uh, day of the summer school, uh, which is a, a roundtable titled Is a New Economic International Economic Order Possible? Yes, we're still uh, talking about th uh, that. <laughs> and um, uh, it's uh, going to be moderated by Richard Kuzul Wright, and speakers are Kevin Gallagher, Jamie Martin, Vijay Prashad, Kate Aronoff, and Cecilia Nahon. Uh, so we expect you tomorrow uh, for this uh, last session. I would like to thank you all. Thank you, thank you especially uh, Arjun Jayadev and Susan Newman for their excellent presentation and their availability for in the debate. Thank you, Ursula. Yeah, thank you, and thanks all for participating. Goodbye. Okay,